All right, so uh, we resume class again today. And Gishra was explaining that last week uh, our, um, our Wednesday class was cut short because we had some internet uh, problems and the line was cut off and it just never returned on that day. And then again, we had to cancel this, this Saturday class because in the monastery, they had a big uh, puja related to one of the great uh, days that are related to the activities of uh, Lama Tsongkhapa. So it was a two-day puja for Saturday and Sunday. And uh, therefore, you know, everyone was attending there. So so today we are returning and we are at the place of um, the text where we're doing how to train in the Bodhisattva contact in general. So this has two uh, and, and then how to train in the last two perfections in particular. So for the first one, how to train in the Bodhisattva contact in general, um, in that we're to go into the six perfections and last week we started with the perfection of generosity and as you can see here it just gives a threefold classification of generosity basically it says there are three types of generosity but Geshla would like to supplement a little bit some more material on generosity Okay, so we have explained the first one. The first one is the supreme basis. The second one is supreme nature, or you could say supreme things, because uh, this refers to practicing generosity with everything that can be given, right? Any, the nature of en every entity, every object, everything that can be given, you are giving this. And also when you are giving this, it's very good to never lose the thought from your mind that says, I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm releasing these items. Okay, the third one is supreme aim. So supreme aim here means that I'm practicing generosity with the ultimate purpose or aim of bringing about the immediate um, happiness and the ultimate benefit of all sentient beings. So to whomever I'm giving, I'm giving it in order to benefit them in the short term and in the long run. Okay, so we continue with number four, which is a supreme method. And uh, here supreme method is said to be to practice uh, generosity that is influenced by the non-conceptual pristine wisdom. So this non-conceptual pristine wisdom is actually referring to direct realization of emptiness. Obviously, this can only refer to advanced bodhisattvas, but it cannot apply to someone who is a beginner. So for the level of the beginner, this would refer to practicing generosity that is even influenced with an intellectual understanding of the nature of phenomena. For number five, which is supreme dedication, whatever virtue we generate through this uh, practice of generosity, we generate it for complete enlightenment. And the last one, which is supreme purity, it means we practice this generosity for the purpose of uh, stopping uh, afflictive and knowledge obscurations. So it is said that when we practice generosity, it is excellent if we can practice generosity that is complete in all these six supreme aspects. Mm -hmm. The other thing that is said is that when we practice generosity, but not just generosity, any of the other perfections as well, we should do it in a way that all the other six perfections are also present. Okay, so if we give an example here of um, practicing generosity by giving teachings, right? So we say that this is the practice of generosity. How can you do this so that it includes all the other types of the six perfections? So if you can actually practice restraining considerations that hearers and solitary realizers have, you have the perfection of ethics. If you have set your goal to reach the state of Buddhahood, and then you say what 
I will practice generosity as a means to get there. And whilst I practice generosity, no matter what criticism or obstacles or harm other sentient beings cause to me, I will not become upset or distracted. So this actually is the practice of patience as you're practicing generosity. Further, you can have this aspiration to increase your capacity for generosity or to increase your practice of generosity. So this is the perfection of enthusiastic effort. Then uh, you can dedicate whatever virtue you create through your generosity towards enlightenment, but you do this dedication with single-pointed concentration. So this is the perfection of concentration. And finally, you have the perfection of wisdom because you have that understanding that you as the giver, the gift that you are giving, and the other person who is the recipient equally lack inherent existence. So this is how we practice with a combination of all six perfections. So when we say that we practice, let's say here generosity, that includes all six perfections, we have the generosity of generosity. So the generosity of generosity refers to yourself giving something to somebody else or also inspiring other people to practice generosity. So this is the generosity of generosity. Then we have the ethics of generosity. We have the patience of generosity. We have the enthusiastic effort of generosity. We have the concentration of generosity and we have the wisdom of, of um, generosity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if let's say now you are practicing uh, generosity with uh, material things, there is, if you look at the great exposition of the stages of the path, you will have for that there is a great explanation of that because there is a, a presentation of how to give and what to give, how to give. When we're explaining how to give, we want to explain what is appropriate to give and what is not appropriate to give. Um, and there is also um, an explanation about the attitude that you should have for giving. We have the actual giving, actual giving of gener uh, material things, and also we have mental giving. Then we have what you do if you are unable to do, and then we have how you rely on remedies to overcome whatever is blocking you from giving. Actually, when we present this, so we have four uh, classifications. We have four things that we need to consider. The first one is the basis. The basis here refers to the recipient. If you're giving something, you're giving it to someone other than yourself, isn't it? So this is the basis. The second thing to consider is your attitude. What are you thinking when you are giving that thing away. The third thing is your conduct uh, or the exact way in which you are giving this. And the last one is the actual thing because there are things that are suitable to be given and things that are not suitable to be given. So we'll begin with the first one, that is the basis. The basis here are ba re refers to the recipient. And we have a list of 10 different types of recipients. So number one in the list are our relatives and friends who have benefited you. Number two are enemies who have caused you harm. Number three are, you know, other people, let's say, you know, the average, the neutral uh, person that has neither benefited you nor caused any harm to you. Uh, number four is those who have good qualities, such as, for example, ethics. Number five is those who, ha who have faults. So, for example, those who have confused or deteriorated ethics. Uh, number five are those who are inferior to you. Number six are those who are equal to you. Number seven, no, actually, this is number eight, those who are superior to you. And then the last two categories, number nine is the rich and the happy. And number 10 is the poor and the destitute. 
Okay, so we have explained the basis, which is the 10 types of recipients, really. And the next one is the attitude or the motivation you should have when you give. So here we have two types of motivation. Motivation that should have three positive or good attitudes and then motivation that is to be eliminated. So for the first one, motivation that is correct and it should have three attitudes. What are those three attitudes? First of all, it is focusing on the purpose. So when you practice generosity, right, whether you're giving your body or your possessions or your root of virtue, you think, I do this practice of generosity in order to complete the perfection of my generosity. So you're focusing on this purpose. That's why I'm practicing generosity. I want to complete this perfection. The second one is you are focusing on on the gift, on the actual thing that you give away. So when you focus on the gift, um, what happen, the way the bodhisattvas think, all right, they practice generosity is, what I give right now belongs to others because I have already given everything, dedicated everything to others. So it is as they are receiving something that was kept in trust, so it is as if it was theirs from the beginning and they gave it to me in order to keep it for a little while. And now I'm giving it back. I'm returning what was already theirs from the beginning. Okay, so this is focusing on the gift. And the last one is focusing on the recipient. So you say, this person, whether they are asking me to give or they are not asking me to give, actually they are acting as a teacher for me to perfect my practice of generosity. So these are the three attitudes, focusing on the purpose, focusing on the gift, and focusing on the recipient. Mm. Okay. All right, so we have already explained motivation, the correct motivation that should have three attitudes. But at the same time, there are certain types of motivations that should be abandoned, they should be eliminated when we practice generosity. There is uh, um, seven or eight, a list of seven or eight uh, for those. So the first one is to believe in supremacy of bad views, right? So that means that you have wrong views, but you consider those to be correct. So for example, you're thinking there's no result that comes from the practice of generosity or uh, by doing bloody sacrifices, like killing animals, I can offer the meat and the blood to the three jewels, and this is a practice of Dharma. So these are wrong attitudes, and they have to be eliminated, the wrong views that have to be eliminated from your motivation. Okay, the second motivation that should be eliminated is arrogance. So what we mean by that is that you give something to someone who needs it, but at the same time you despise the person or you put that person down, or you, once you practice generosity, you are competing with others. You're trying to prove that you are their biggest sponsor, let's say, or you have this idea, there's no one who can practice generosity as I do. No one has the capacity to give as much as I can. So this is arrogance. The third one is called support. So your motivation should be free from support. And support here refers to having expectations for fame and praise. Thinking if I practice generosity, now people will say, oh, you know, what an amazing person always gives, right? So get rid of that expectation for praise. The fourth motivation to eliminate is uh, discouragement. So as you are preparing to, to practice generosity, to give something, you should have the joy. And whilst you are actually giving it, you should not generate any regret. And at any time, you should bring into mind the vast uh, acts of generosity that bodhisattvas are capable of doing and from your side generate this enthusiasm or this aspiration to say I will also increase 
my capacity for generosity. So it's the opposite of regretting, being discouraged, limiting yourself, and so forth. Uh, the fifth one is you practice generosity, but at the same time you turn your back on someone else. So this indicates that you have partiality. Uh, perhaps you will favor your friends, uh, you will avoid uh, people you consider to be your enemies or strangers and so forth. So the important thing is to practice generosity with compassion and have this even-mindedness that does not exclude anyone. The sixth one is uh, to eliminate the motivation of expecting something in return. Expecting something in return means you're thinking, okay, I'm giving this gift now, but I expect that they will also support me in this way or give me back another gift or, you know, do some favor for me and so forth. So you're giving, but you're expecting something. The seventh one is uh, getting rid of the motivation that is uh, having some expectations in terms of fruition. So fruition here refers to expecting to see results in your next life. So you're thinking, if I practice generosity now, I will have an excellent body in my next life and I will have great amount of resources. So I'm doing it so that I will be rich in my next life. So we shouldn't be making these calculations. We should consider that all those uh, material things do not have any essence, any substance. And what is of real importance is to reach the state of Buddhahood, right? So thinking in this way, we should practice generosity uh, without having this expectation for to receive riches and wealth in the next life. You say, I have these material things that can be useful towards enlightenment, but otherwise they don't have other, other purpose. Mm. Okay, the last one, number eight in the list, actually refers to motivation that comes with wrong livelihood. So, for example, what you're thinking here is that if I practice generosity now, let's say the minister or whatever, the prime minister or whatever will notice me uh, and they will reward me or they will say that I'm a really important person and so forth. So, again, that's a wrong motivation, needs to be eliminated. Okay, so we have seen what is the right motivation we should have when we practice generosity. We say the correct motivation is an a motivation that should have three attitudes. First of all, focusing on the purpose. So you say I practice generosity now so that I can complete the perfection of generosity with the ultimate aim of reaching the state of full enlightenment for the sake of sentient beings. Second, we should have the attitude focusing on the gift, saying what I give now is something that belongs to others anyway. I was just temporarily uh, entrusted with keeping this object and I'm just giving it back. And finally, we should be focusing on the recipient, thinking that they are my teacher helping me to perfect the practice of generosity. So these are the three correct attitudes to have when you practice generosity. All the other things that we mentioned are mistakes in the motivation, such as, for example, holding wrong views as being correct, um, having arrogance, uh, having the support of expecting fame and praise and so forth, uh, being discouraged and so on and so forth. So we give with the correct motivation. Mm. Okay, so as you see here, we are looking at the ways of practicing generosity. First of all, we have exp explained the recipients and we have given a list of 10 recipients. The second thing is the motivation. We said the correct motivation must have three attitudes and must be free of eight types of faults. So after the motivation is how to give. In terms of how to give, we begin by explaining how not to give and then how to actually give. All right. So when we talk about how not to give, the first thing is not giving straight away, but delaying. 
So this is a mistake. If someone asks for something, you should give it straight away. You should not procrastinate. You should not delay. Okay, so the second way of, of which is not a correct way to give is to give under the distress of afflictions. So let's say someone is coming and requesting something for you to give and actually for some reason you have become angry with that person, all right? So once you are angry towards that person, it is not proper, it is not correct to give. The right attitude to give is to say, you know, this person is lacking something, they need my support, so I will give them. So you give but not under the influence of afflictions and anger and so forth. The third one is that it is inappropriate to give if you have involved yourself in activities that are not in accordance with the Dharma and they are not in accordance with the way that things are done in usually in society, right? So if you are involved in any situation like this, it's not appropriate to practice generosity. The fourth one is uh, making giving, but actually giving less than you promised. So in the beginning, you have made the commitment and you say, I will give that much or I will give this good quality. But when it comes to the actual time of giving, you give less amount or you give an object that has an inferior value. So practicing generosity like this is not correct. Okay, number five in the list is giving in return for favors. And the way that you do it is by reminding them how many times in the past you have helped them. So you say, remember, I've helped you in the past in this and that occasion, and I am also helping you now. So that is the wrong way to give. The next one is giving in small installments although you are capable of giving the whole amount all at once so if you have the capacity to give everything that you have committed it's much better to do it quickly at once rather than dragging out the donation and just giving small amounts here and there okay number seven in the list um, is applicable to those who have power. So let's say you become a ruler, like a king or something like this, and um, you might kidnap uh, the wife or the children of somebody else and give those as a present to somebody. All right, so this is inappropriate. Uh, number eight is taking things by putting pressure from your parents or from your servants and those things that you take although they are unwilling to give them to you so you pressurize them and you take those things and then you practice generosity with those things okay okay the next one um number nine is um, giving a gift that will harm somebody so this is inappropriate to do Okay, number 10 in our list is uh, to actually remain idle. Like yourself, you're not lifting a hand and you ask somebody else to give out the gifts, all right? So this is wrong because they say that if you actually practice generosity and you distribute the gifts with your own hands, there is much bigger merit that you accumulate. So it is very good to be personally involved uh, than just sit in the corner and ask somebody else to do the actual giving. Number 11 is giving to someone and at the same time you criticize that person and you deride them and you scold them. So imagine that you are scolding someone and you're putting that person down as you're giving them a gift, right? So not appropriate. Okay, number 12 is giving once you go against the prescribed instructions of the Buddha. So the Buddha has laid down certain, um, let's say, I wouldn't say the law, but he has said some prohibitions, right? And if you violate those um, whilst you're practicing generosity, it is inappropriate. 
Yes, Kishla. Number 13 in the list of uh, wrong uh, uh, behavior whilst you're giving is that instead of giving resources, as soon as you accumulate them, as soon as you create them, you keep them for many years, kind of like you're hoarding those things. And after a long time, you decide to give some of this away. So it is said that these types of behavior are behaviors to be abandoned, to be eliminated when you practice generosity. So we have explained uh, the different ways that are not appropriate for giving. And now what is the proper way, the proper attitude, your conduct so that you should have when you give to others? So it says, first of all, your demeanor, your exp expression should be very pleasant. So you should have a smiling face. You should use honest, but, um, you know, like friendly words. Um, you should not, you know, you're not deriding the other person. You are praising them. You saying something friendly and pleasant. You um, approach them in a respectful manner. You give with respect. You give with your own hands. You give at the appropriate time. As we say, you do not procrastinate, but as as soon as the request is made, you as quickly as you can, you make the offering. You give in a way that does not harm anybody. And also, whilst you're practicing generosity, if there are some difficulties and hardship, you practice patience and you tolerate these things. Okay, the other way in which we give is we give by helping others also. So the situation is like this. So let's say you have resources, uh, you would like to give things away. But there are other people who have resources, but actually they are very stingy. They do not want to give things away. They have not cultivated this practice. So what you do is you go and visit their home and you say to them, I have many resources. I have many things that I want to give away to other people because I want to perfect and complete my practice of generosity. So if you meet any people, if anyone comes north, knocking on your door who is in need of something, please give them my address and send them to my place. I will practice generosity. And from your side, please rejoice in my practice of generosity. So in this way, you sort of like implant the idea of generosity in their minds. Yes, Okay, so it said that if you practice in this way, you're actually helping to remove the imprints of miserliness from the minds of these people. So eventually they will be able to start practicing generosity, even if it is small generosity, they will engage the practice and gradually they will be able to increase it. So this is how we help others to be generous. Also, um, whilst we are discussing this, the way to help others to be generous, there are different ways to help them. So, for example, it might be the case that uh, one of your teachers or your abbots and so forth is not practicing generosity. Or perhaps there are some people who are totally lacking the resources. They're very poor. They cannot practice generosity. So what you do is you put away some items right? And then you give them to them and you say, here, take these items and with these things, you make offerings, practice generosity with these items. So if you do like this, you actually help them to remove, as we say, the imprints of um, lack of generosity. Uh, and basically, you bring those beings into maturity, because you take your minds from this state where they are thinking, I will not give, or I cannot give, or it's not my habit to give, and you make them, you instruct them to give, right? So this is said to help yourself generate a lot of merit, but also it's helping them generate merit. So this is how you're maturing them. 
Okay, so, so far we have covered the basis, which is the recipient, so the motivation or the intention that you have when you give. Then we have explained how to give, and we come now into the fourth uh, um, subheading, uh, which is the actual things, the gifts that you give. And we see here that we have an explanation that there are certain things that are suitable to give and other things that are not suitable to give. Okay, so from uh, the great exposition of the stages of the path, um, it says, Bodhisattvas should give to others those things which immediately produce in the recipients pleasurable feelings that are free from the causes of a miserable rebirth and which ultimately will benefit them, either eliminating their sins or setting them in virtue. All right, so it says you give to others things that will immediately benefit them or things that in the long run will benefit them by reducing their afflictions um, or increasing their happiness. Okay, it says even if these things do not immediately bring happiness, they should give them if they are beneficial in the end. So even if right now they don't see the benefit, if it is something that will benefit them in the future, this is something that you should give. Okay, so these are the things that are suitable to be given. And now for the things that are not suitable to be given. These are things that right now in the present and also in the future will harm them. Or things that might not harm them right now, they might seem to be very pleasant right now, but in the future, they will cause them harm. So these are the objects that are not suitable to give. So we're examining here the things that you can actually give away and we are looking at what is appropriate to give and what is not appropriate to give. Also here we have an, a, another classification a, in terms of things. So you can have internal things and external things that you give away. Internal things refers to your body. And external things refer to things such as material possessions and so forth. So in terms of practicing generosity with your body, which is something which is internal, we have a threefold presentation. I think it is inappropriate giving from the point of view of the time, inappropriate giving from the point of view of the purpose, and inappropriate giving from the point of view of the person who is requesting. So inappropriate to practice generosity with your body in terms of the time refers to the time where you have not reached that level of mental stability. So mental stability with practicing this type of generosity comes when you have fully developed great compassion. So when you have fully developed uh, uh, great compassion, it is appropriate to practice generosity with your body. But prior to achieving this, the, your mind is not capable of dealing with this type of generosity. So you should not do it. The second one is inappropriate giving from the point of view of the purpose. So what we mean here is that is it is inappropriate to practice generosity with your body and limbs and so forth for a small, for a trifling purpose, okay? When it is a great purpose of, and it is the right time and it will benefit many sentient beings, you can practice generosity with your body and your limbs. Otherwise, somebody asks you, for some unimportant reason to, to give away your limbs, it is inappropriate to do it. Okay, so the last one is inappropriate uh, giving from the point of view of the one who is asking. All right, so the first category that we have here are deities that are not actually deities who favor the side of virtue. They do not favor Dharma. So we're talking about um, kind of like demons, basically, right? So if a demon asks you for your body or your limbs with the intention of causing harm to other sentient beings, it is inappropriate to give it to them, even though they request you. Another case of an inappropriate uh, 
person who is requesting uh, will be someone who is mad, mentally disturbed, uh, mentally unstable, and so forth. All right. So if someone like this asks you to practice generosity with your body or your limbs, it is appropriate to refuse. So it's uh, when we practice generosity, the generosity that we practice should benefit others. So you do not give your body or parts of the body in an activity or in a situation that can cause harm. So we are in the section where we are examining the thing that you actually gift and we explain that there are appropriate gifts and inappropriate gifts. So looking at the thing that is given away, we say that we have a twofold classification. It can be something which is inner or something which is outer. If it is inner, it refers to your body, uh, the limbs of the body, the organs of the body and so forth. And we have explained that there are certain Certain circumstances in which it is inappropriate to practice generosity. Although you might not have miserliness from your side, or although you might be ready to practice generosity with your body and limbs and so forth, it might be inappropriate from the point of view of the time. It might be inappropriate from the point of view of the purpose, if it is a trifling, small purpose, or it might be inappropriate to give from the point of view of the purse of the being, the person who is requesting you to practice this type of generosity. So we are looking at situations where it is inappropriate to practice generosity with your body and parts of the body. But any other occasion other than these three, if you are ready, then it is appropriate to practice this type of generosity. Okay, so we have explained uh, practicing generosity with internal things, the body and the parts of the body, and now we're looking at outer or external things. So this refers to various material things, resources, and so forth. So we're going to look at here at uh, five occasions where giving is inappropriate. So it can be inappropriate in terms of the time, inappropriate in terms of the gift, inappropriate in terms of the person, inappropriate in terms of the material thing, and inappropriate in terms of the purpose. So for the first one, inappropriate in terms of the time. For example, if you offer food in the afternoon to someone who is ordained or to someone who has taken one day vows. So they have special, you know, there are specifications at the, about the time of the meal. And instead of offering meal before noon, you offer meal in the afternoon or in the evening. It is a gift, but it's inappropriate in terms of the time. Okay, the next one is an inappropriate gift uh, uh, from the point of inappropriate from the point of view of the gift. So, as an example, um, for to give leftover food to someone who is observing vows, so someone who has the bodhisattva vows, or someone who has ordination vows, someone who has one day vows, and so forth. And what do you give to them? You give them leftover food or you give them food that is polluted and contaminated with unclean substances, such as, for example, feces and urine and uh, mucus and uh, vomit and so forth. So inappropriate to give those things. Or other examples are to give onion and <laughs> garlic and meat to those who are vegetarian and uh, alcohol to those who do not drink and so forth. Uh, these are uh, foods that they do not usually partake or perhaps they have taken vows not to take this food or this type of food and drink is unsuitable, inappropriate for them. And then you offer it to them. Even if they have the wish to taste it, it you know it and it's inappropriate to give it. Okay, the next one is inappropriate giving from the point of view of the person. So this one comes down to giving for a reason that is trifle, that is, you know, a, a small thing. So they're asking you, the person who is asking is not really, does not have a great need and that practice of generosity will not establish anything significant. 
The next one is inappropriate from the point of view of, of the material thing. So let's say that you are offering food to your parents and that food is infested with insects. And so, so you give them rice, let's say, right? That has maggots and insects and so forth. So it's inappropriate. Another case that falls in this category is practicing generosity with your own wife or with your children and wanting to give them away as a gift to someone else, even though your spouse and your children do not want to go to this other household. The fifth one is inappropriate giving from the point of view of the person. So someone is requesting you to practice generosity and give things that can actually cause harm to yourself or to others. Things such as weapons, poisons, different types of medicinal, you know, um, pharmaceuticals, let's say, uh, fire, alcohol, and so forth. Okay, so they are requesting you to give something for the purpose of causing harm to others. So you say no to that. Tanaskishla. Okay, so here when we explain external objects that are inappropriate to give, we present this in five ways because it can be inappropriate giving from the point of view of the time, uh, from the point of view of the gift, from the point of view of the person, from the point of view of the material thing and from the point of view of the person. Okay, so having explained what is inappropriate to give, then what is right, what is appropriate to give. So uh, we must give things um, when the time is correct, when, so when the time is not prohibited by the Buddha, and we must give them with respect to the other person, and we must give something which is suitable and appropriate for the other person to receive. So this is what is suitable to give. Okay, so just uh, to recap what we have covered so far, we're talking about the actual way of uh, giving material things. So in that, we have to look at how to give things away. Then the next thing is what to do if you are unable to give. And the last one is the remedies for the hindrances of generosity. When we look at the first subject, which is how to give things away, we present this under four main outlines. First of all, we explain the list of recipients. Then we explain the, type, the right type of motivation to give. Then the third one is how to give, right? So there are things that you don't give and so forth. Then it is um, the actual things, external and internal items that are suitable or not suitable to give. Okay, so having covered all this, we'll come to the next subject, which is what to do if you are unable to give. Okay, so let's say due to miserliness, you're not capable of practicing generosity. So if this is the case, you should remind yourself that at the time of death, yourself and all your material possessions are going to be destroyed. They're going to be separated. It is certain that at the time of death, you will be separated from all these objects. However, if you were capable of giving it away, right now, whilst you're still alive, it would benefit someone else who is in need. And in this way, you would even enjoy seeing someone else benefiting from that object, right? So also you think that if I don't give this now, if I don't give it away now, it means that my attachment will not be reduced. And also in the future lives, I will have even less to give away and it will be even more difficult for me to practice generosity in the future. So thinking along these lines, you kind of motivate yourself to overcome your difficulty of giving. Okay, so um, we come to the next subheading, which is the antidotes that we rely upon when we find 
that there are hindrances to practicing generosity. Actually, in the text, we have four types of hindrances. The first one is that you're not used to, you don't have familiarity with practicing generosity. The second one is a decline in your fortune and your resources. The third one is that you have a lot of attachment. And the fourth one is that you do not see the result of generosity. Okay, so for the first one, there is hindrance, something is stopping you from practicing generosity. And that, that thing is your lack of familiarity. So someone comes and asks you for something, and although you have the capacity, you have the resources, you could give something away. You find that something is stopping you. At that point, you should analyze the situation and say, I understand what's happening here. I'm not eager, I'm not ready to practice generosity because this is not something that I have practiced in my past life. Therefore, I lack familiarity with this practice. So I should try to overcome this and I should try now to place the imprints and familiarity with generosity because if I don't make this effort now, it will be even more difficult in my next life. Again, I will not want to give anything away. So just recognize that it is lack of familiarity from previous life and make an effort to overcome this. Okay, we come to the second hindrance, uh, which is hindrance due to having very few resources, like the decline, your fortune has declined. So it might be the case that actually you have very few possessions, you are a very poor person, and therefore you know, the thought, perhaps the thought of practicing generosity arises, but somehow you cannot bring yourself to give to others from the little things that you have. So if this is the case, you actually have again to analyze the situation and say, how come I am so poor in this life? Why is it that I don't have resources to give away? It is because in my past lives, as I was circling around in cyclic existence, I didn't make the effort to help others. I didn't give things away to others. I didn't practice generosity. So now in this life, I find myself with very limited resources. So to reverse this pattern, what I have to do is definitely I have to give things to others in order to help them and benefit them. And even though that means that I will have to suffer, let's say I have to go hungry in this life and so forth, this is a type of suffering that I should tolerate uh, because I need to reverse this pattern of you know, poverty that has come from previously not helping others, not giving to others. Okay, the next uh, hindrance is the hindrance of attachment. So you might have a particular object that you possess that is made of a very expensive material, it's something which is beautiful, rare, expensive and so on and so forth and therefore you have great attachment towards this object so you find that you, you find it very difficult to practice generosity with this object so at this point again you should analyze the situation and say it is my attachment here that will cause me a lot of suffering um, I possess this object and right now I think that I am happy I'm very fortunate however my connection, my relationship, my grasping to this object is actually going to become the cause for a lot of suffering in the future. So like this, contemplate the shortcomings of attachment in order to overcome this hindrance. Okay, the last one is the hindrance of not seeing the goal or the result. And that means is that you do not see the connection between the practice of generosity contributing towards uh, supreme enlightenment, right? So you just think it is very good to have resources, accumulate, accumulate wealth, and uh, this thing will make me happy, right? Or if I have a bit extra, I can practice generosity. But you cannot see generosity as being a cause that leads you to enlightenment.
measurement. So obviously, in order to overcome this, you have to contemplate the impermanent deteriorating nature of these material possessions that you have. They are all uh, conditioned phenomena, compounded phenomena, and all of those things are impermanent. Right, so you should consider that all of these resources naturally they leave you on their own, right? Because they deteriorate. Okay, so for this reason, you should by considering this, you should prepare yourself and think, I will give and I will dedicate towards enlightenment. Okay, so we'll come to the second division because up to now we were talking about generosity that you actually give something. And now we'll come to the other case, which is uh, generosity, which is only something mental. So mental generosity. So the way that you do this is you take yourself to a quiet, isolated place and you don't let your mind be distracted by various thoughts. Instead, you concentrate your thoughts and you mentally create or you visualize all the various things that different sentient beings require or would like to receive. So we, you create an abundance of these various objects and um, you imagine that you offer this and you do this in a very sincere way. Obviously, the practice requires a certain amount of concentration. As I say, you should do it like it's a serious practice. Don't just do it with a distracted mind and so forth. So they say that this is the way that uh, beginner bodhisattvas practice all the way up to reaching the first ground. Because up to that point, bodhisattvas might experience lack of uh, material resources. Once bodhisattvas reach the first ground, there is no time, there is no case, no opportunity where they lack resources. They have unlimited access to every resource. But up to that point, they might be lacking material capacity. So practicing mental generosity is a very useful practice. So it's a very useful practice for beginners, not just beginner bodhisattvas, but useful practice for beginners as well. <laughs> so uh, we're just going to summarize here the perfection or the practice of generosity. So you say you take the Bodhisattva vows and having taken the vows, you make a lot of aspirational prayers to be able to learn uh, this practice of generosity and to be able to apply it. You will be able to do this when you reach the higher grounds. However, even before you reach the higher grounds of a bodhisattva, you can try to do this on, a, you know, like mentally on an imaginary level. So it is a mental training what you do, right? You have to understand clearly what is allowed and what is prohibited because we went into this explanation of what is suitable to give, when it is suitable to give, to whom it is suitable to give and all this. And uh, uh, if you do the practice with a certain amount of respect, understanding what is permitted and what is not permitted, uh, you should do this with a lot of respect for the practice and for the recipients. Okay, in particular, you must apply antidotes to overcome uh, your attachment so that you will be able to give away your body, your resources, and your root of virtue. And after you put this effort in cultivating generosity, you should gen generate this joy and say, you know, although it doesn't come natural to me, although I might not have the most, the unlimited resources, nevertheless, I put a lot of effort in developing this. And if I don't put this effort, it means it will be even harder in my next lives. But what I do here is I put, you know, the foundation for practicing generosity. And even if you're not able to complete the practice in this life, with this attitude, you will be able to complete it soon in your next life. So um, this is 
you know, this is the great way of practicing in the first one of the six perfections, which is the practice of generosity. So I guess I was saying I based the presentation today on the great expositions of the stages of the path, but we did not go into any of the quotations because there are many quotations of text, so just the main points. So apologies, we are 15 minutes over the time, but we presented the first of the six perfections. All right, so, so let's do the dedication prayers. Thank you.